As mentioned earlier, there is a prominent association between science fiction literature and the development of evolution as a theory. We are all familiar with the argument that continues to rage heatedly in today's society between those that believe evolution is an elegant and obvious theory that explains the complexities and continued development of life on this planet, and those who do not. The flip side of the argument follows that evolutionary theory allows no room for the creation of life on Earth by a divine hand, and the resulting disagreement goes back to the time of Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin's theories of evolution by means of natural selection. Their two papers were presented to the Linnaean Society on the 1st of July 1858, and were jointly entitled On the Tendency of Species to Form Varieties, and On the Perpetuation of Varieties and Species by Natural Means of Selection, and later published in August of the same year. The theory of evolution by natural selection as presented in Darwin's On the Origin of Species, which would see publication in the following year, albeit not in its finalised form, and his later work The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, would see the beginnings of a heated disagreement that would continue up to modern times. The main political arena for this debate is generally within the sphere of education, particularly in the United States of America, where the question of whether a religious creationist viewpoint should be taught now very much in the mould of the intelligent design argument, or whether the theory of evolution should have primacy in the classroom. Just as it is today, Darwin's theories were quite controversial during his own times. The dominant viewpoint up until then was what we refer to as the fixity or immutability of species. This was combined with the concept that the Earth was only 5,000 years old, and that life on Earth was brought into existence by a divine creator. Prior to the publication of On the Origin of Species, science seemed to be able to prove the development of life on Earth very much on a par with religious viewpoints. Baron Georges Cuvier's essay on the theory of the Earth, published in 1827 for example, presents a treatise on the age of our world from an early 19th century perspective. It accounts for not only an approximate age of the planet, but also for the nature of the species which exist upon it. In reference to these ideas, this work comprises an attempt to examine both antediluvian myths and the post-deluge societies of the ancient world to come up with a plausible attempt at dating the planet. Cuvier's theory of a catastrophic deluge led to this belief in addition to explaining how the current existing fossil records produced examples of species no longer surviving on the planet. I agree, therefore, with Messrs. Deluc and Dolomieu in thinking that if anything in geology be established, it is that the surface of our globe has undergone a great and sudden revolution, the date of which cannot be referred to a much earlier period than five or six thousand years ago. That this revolution overwhelmed and caused to disappear the countries which were previously inhabited by man, and the species of animals now best known. This however was not the only view and discourses through the science of natural history were beginning to produce ideas that contradicted this. As much as evolutionary theory was not actually seen as a taboo subject when it was discussed in the early 19th century, no one had yet been able to provide a solid and convincing hypothesis that met with universal agreement. Early doubters of theories such as Cuvier's included the likes of Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles, who had himself been one of the early pioneers of evolutionary theory, in particular with his poetical works The Loves of the Plants, The Economy of Vegetation, and the more scientific work Zoonomia or The Laws of Organic Life, which was published in two volumes. The Botanic Garden is of particular interest not just for its ideas on evolution, but also for the fact that it can be considered a work of proto-science fiction, speculating as it does on concepts such as steam power, powered flight, and submarines. It was in Zoonomia that Erasmus Darwin put forward some of his more detailed notions on evolution that show the strength of his convictions in his ideas. From thus meditating on the great similarity of the structure of the warm-blooded animals, and at the same time of the great changes they undergo both before and after their nativity, and by considering in how minute a portion of time many of the changes of animals above described have been produced, would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, 
Would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity, and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity, world without end? Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was another naturalist who put forth some of the more convincing arguments about evolution, and would in turn actually become the proponent of the main theory which would compete against Darwin's. Lamarck's ideas on evolution were primarily presented in his work Philosophie Zoologique, published in 1809, and it does represent the first properly assembled and coherent theory of evolution that went against the received ideas of the time. Lamarck's ideas were focused on two key principles which suggested that evolution of animal life was spurred by two natural forces or mechanisms. The first of these was that animal life was driven forward by a mechanism that meant that animals evolved from simpler forms to more complex examples of life. However, the problem with the origins of these species, according to Lamarck's ideas, was that simplistic animal species were produced by spontaneous creation, a process which continued throughout time to create new species. The second of these principles was that there was a mechanism which allowed animals to adapt to their given specific environments. Depending on the nature of the environment, certain species would develop or lose characteristics which could then be passed on to their offspring. This idea was known as the theory of acquired characteristics, though today it is also referred to as soft inheritance or Lamarckism. Charles Darwin would however fully reject this theory, seeing it as not being the result of any given natural law. Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection came to prominence after the publication of arguably his most famous work, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and the subsequent The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. With the prominence to which Darwin's theories of evolution and natural selection arose, the validity of concepts such as immutability and soft inheritance as part of evolutionary theory were fast becoming moot, although as long as Darwin had his detractors, these older viewpoints would continue to have their supporters. Darwin himself acknowledged Lamarck's contribution to evolutionary theory, noting that Lamarck was the first man whose conclusions on this subject excited much attention, describing him as a justly celebrated naturalist. Darwin's work fundamentally changed how human beings view their place in the natural world, and in doing so, called into question so many ideas and preconceptions that mankind held upon its existence. As we have seen with Erasmus Darwin's work, science fiction had an early interest in evolution, and in the time following on the origin of species, it would only be within a very short number of years that it would become apparent how important a subject it would become to the genre. Notable examples of this are easily found in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and probably none more famous than three of H. G. Wells' works, The Time Machine, The War of the Worlds, and The Island of Dr. Moreau. The Time Machine depicts the development of two divergent human species, the Eloi and the Morlocks, in the far future of humanity, and show mankind's evolution directed by social Darwinism. The War of the Worlds again is suggestive of human evolution through the Martians, who represent how humanity will evolve perhaps in a million years time. The island of Dr Moreau, as much as a response to the debate over vivisection in Wells's time, shows a curious prediction of gene splicing and genetic engineering. Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men, and Star Maker, are notable both for their vast timescales, which dwarf even those of science fiction novels such as Dune. Last and First Men explores the theorised evolutions of humanity, some 18 in all, through eons of time until their eventual extinction. Star Maker is even greater in scope essentially, being a complete future history of the universe, and explores numerous evolutions of beings and civilizations up until an omega point, where the universal collective consciousness comes into contact with its creator.
Many other science fiction works continue to produce thoughtful and speculative viewpoints on evolution up until today, where the question seems to focus more on the post-human and extropian philosophies that are being extolled in the scientific and philosophical communities in regard to current thinking in medical science. Science fiction has also speculated on natural selection from the post-apocalyptic scenarios that the genre often presents in the post-World War II period. Works such as John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, Walter M. Miller Jr.'s A Canticle for Leibowitz, and P. D. James's The Children of Men, all present quite varied and differing looks at issues arriving from evolutionary change, natural selection, and the struggle of humanity to survive in new and difficult, often post-apocalyptic, environments. In consideration of the Dune series, I believe that there are two works from the Victorian era of science fiction which are of critical importance to Frank Herbert's opus. As excellent examples of pre-Golden Age science fiction, it must be noted that they do not merely act as an influence upon Herbert's work, a mere nod to a time that he would have viewed was producing original and quality science fiction. They represent strong ideological platforms that Frank Herbert would extrapolate heavily from, and use to create an enormous cultural and historical framework for the Dune series. As I have mentioned earlier, they are Samuel Butler's Erewhon, and to a lesser extent Edward bulwer lytons The Coming Race. The Coming Race is a novel which was published anonymously at first, and presented an examination of an advanced underground civilization known as the Vril Ya, who wait the day when they will arise and remove humanity from their place as the dominant species in the world above ground. The author's intention centred on the curiosity of Victorian society over the differences between Darwinism and Lamarckism, especially the Darwinian proposition that a coming race is destined to supplant our races. The Vril Ya are in fact evolved from tadpoles, and the anonymous narrator is credulous of this lineage as presented to him by Alf Lin, one of the Vril, and is no doubt similar to the incredulity experienced by Victorians in light of the implications of Darwin's theories presented in On the Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. Among the pithy sayings which, according to tradition, the philosopher bequeathed to posterity in rhythmical form and sententious brevity, this is notably recorded. Humble yourselves, my descendants, the father of your race was a twat. Exalt yourselves, my descendants, for it was the same divine thought which created your father that develops itself in exalting you. I presume that none of your race, even in the less enlightened ages, ever believed that the great grandson of a frog became a sententious philosopher, or that any section, I will not say of the lofty Vrilya, but of the meanest varieties of the human race, had its origin in a tadpole. At the same time as presenting us with an instance of similarity to the conflict of common descent between man and apes created by Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, bulwer lytton also describes the development of a visible nerve on the hands of the Vrilya, which is very much in the mode of the Lamarckian hypothesis of evolution, that is, the theory of acquired characteristics or soft inheritance. The Vrilya have been consciously able to alter their evolution over a period of time to facilitate their use of Vril, the wondrous fluid that is the source of all their power. This adaptation exists in the form of a nerve developed on their hands, which ultimately allows them to facilitate the staffs that they use and serve as conduits for the liquid energy. More remarkable than all this is a visible nerve perceptible under the skin which starts from the wrist, skirting the ball of the thumb, and branching fork-like at the roots of the fore and middle fingers. With your slight formation of thumb, said the philosophical young Guy, and with the absence of the nerve which you find more or less developed in the hands of our race, you can never achieve other than imperfect and feeble power over the agency of Vril. But so far as the nerve is concerned, that is not found in the hands of our earliest progenitors, nor in those of the ruder tribes without the pale of the Vrilya. It has been slowly developed in the course of generations, commencing in the early achievements and increasing with the continuous exercise of the Vril power. Therefore, in the course of one or two thousand years, such a nerve may possibly be engendered in those higher beings of Urias, 
who devote themselves to that paramount science through which is attained command over all the subtler forces of nature permeated by Vril. bulwer lightens The Coming Race is of particular interest here as it provides an interesting comparison to Butler's Erewhon. Both works were published anonymously at first, and their similarity in subject matter if not style caused a degree of speculation on the authorship of Erewhon. Many people speculated that Erewhon had in fact also been written by bulwer lighton whose identity as the author of The Coming Race was not a particularly well kept secret. Whereas Butler's work is presented in the tradition of a utopian satire, often remarked upon as being very much a successor to Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, bulwer lightons is more in the mode of the subterranean adventure, serious in tone, and sharing more similarities to the works of Jules Verne for example. It was Butler who would become one of Charles Darwin's fiercest critics, ultimately rejecting bitterly his ideas of natural selection which he was at first in favour of, and later defending the work of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. bulwer lightons relationship to Dune is not of any major particular significance, with the exception of the similarities between the ubiquitous drugs of Vril and Melange. However, in reading Erewhon or The Coming Race, one inevitably, given any real effort at research or interest, comes across the other work. Their similarities are important, as is the fact that both books were associated with each writer having been published initially as anonymous works. Few drugs in science fiction share such given and varied qualities as Vril and Melange, yet it is of a significance which I do not wish to overstate that both drugs are tied to aspects of evolution. Samuel Butler, also later known as Erewhon Butler, was born in 1835 at Langer Rectory in Nottinghamshire and died in 1902. He was the son of a clergyman, the Reverend Thomas Butler, and received an education at St John's College, Cambridge, where initially having desired to study mathematics, he eventually achieved a first class degree in classics. The initial intent of his family, whom Butler had a reasonably antagonistic relationship with, was to have him ordained in the Anglican clergy as almost a part of a family tradition. His grandfather, Dr Samuel Butler, also having served the Anglican Church as Bishop of Lichfield. Butler however did not wish to enter the clergy, oddly enough like his father who had been pressed into religious service despite his wishes for a career in the navy. Butler did however have an intense dislike for religion in general, particularly due to his strict upbringing, and after questioning his faith and quarrelling with his father over his concerns via correspondence, he decided to leave England prior to his ordination and set forth to New Zealand in 1859. In New Zealand, Butler purchased some land overlooking the Rangitata River on the Canterbury Plains, and became a sheep farmer for the next few years, naming his land Mesopotamia. It was during his time in New Zealand that Butler first read Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Initially, Butler read the work thoroughly, developing a great interest and respect for Charles Darwin's ideas. This was the beginning of Butler's quite serious interest in evolutionary thought, and became one of Darwin's greatest advocates at the time. Butler even wrote a dialogue and sent it to the Christchurch Press in 1862, garnering a reply from a certain Dr Abraham, the Bishop of Wellington. What is of note here is that as Philip Henderson points out, the Bishop indicates that Darwin's work had in fact been anticipated by a number of writers, Darwin's own grandfather Erasmus being amongst them. Notably, this would become a key point in Butler's later attacks on Charles Darwin, and would change his viewpoint on natural selection towards a more Lamarckian attitude. Darwin himself had even written to the Christchurch press complimenting Butler on his theories, but of particular note was Butler's correspondence to the press in 1863 entitled Darwin Among the Machines. This would later form a major part of the three chapters in Erewhon collectively known as the Book of the Machines. The article was not written under Butler's name, but was rather signed by a certain Kilarius, a nom de plume that Butler had used in his articles for the Eagle magazine during his Cambridge days. The key idea here was to present a humorous approach to defending Darwin's ideas by illustrating the evolution of machinery since the days of the Industrial Revolution. Erewhon, or Over the Range, has been described by P. N. Furbank as the most self-sufficient of Butler's books, and to my mind the most completely satisfactory one.
and is together with the way of all flesh his greatest literary achievement. Erewhon is a gentle satire that subtly attacks elements of Victorian society at the time, more so than the posthumously published The Way of All Flesh, which was a biting attack on the values of family life during that era. Erewhon was written in the mode of a pastoral satire. Although often presented as a utopia, the society which Butler presents us is a topsy-turvy land that inverts many of the world's realities in order to highlight the hypocrisy of the times. In the land of Erewhon, for example, illness is illegal and considered to be highly criminal and immoral. At the same time, criminality is seen as an illness, a terrible suffering bestowed on an unfortunate individual, and something which would require the services of a straightener to prevent from happening again. Erewhon is in the tradition of the strange new land discovered through the journey of an individual who provides commentary on the variations of society from the viewpoint of an outsider. This was common in the literature of its kind, and popularised greatly by the likes of Jules Verne, although as Carl Friedman points out, it was a technique quite despised by other writers such as H.G. Wells. The country of Erewhon is discovered by Higgs. During his voyage of discovery through parts of New Zealand, either similar or identical to areas known to Butler during his time living on the South Island, he eventually crosses over the range to discover quite by accident this strange land. Erewhon was not just a work that asked curious questions of Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. In doing so, Butler was applying what he knew of Darwin's theory to the expansion of machine technology since the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. This was, however, one aspect of Erewhon, and makes up a small but significant portion of the novel. Butler felt, however, that the work was more a gentler kind of attack on Victorian morality rather than any kind of major criticism against Charles Darwin. What is important in Erewhon is that the seeds of Butler's future argument against Darwinian evolution were being sown. In looking at the evolution of machines by natural selection, he realised that in gaining an understanding of evolution as presented by Darwin, mankind had been left with a mechanistic view of the universe, something that would seem to be painful for Butler to accept. His later works, Life and Habit, Evolution Old and New, Unconscious Memory, and Luck or Cunning, would solidly attack Darwin's theory and its consequences, in turn creating uproar and notoriety for Butler. This in light of his previous work was somewhat mystifying for Butler, as he mentions in his notebooks. I attack the foundations of morality in Era 1, and nobody cared two straws. I tore open the wounds of my Redeemer as he hung upon the cross in the fair haven, and people rather liked it. But when I attacked Mr Darwin, they were up in arms in a moment. Samuel Butler, despite having been a supporter of Darwin's ideas on natural selection, eventually reeled against them because they gave him little solace as to the point of human existence. Feeling as he did that natural selection provided such a bleak, mechanical and desolate landscape for human beings to inhabit, then Darwin's theory allowed no room for the passing on of human knowledge and achievement. His return to the ideas of inheritance as provided for in evolution by Lamarck was seemingly essential to his mental well-being, and the notion developed in Erewhon and subsequent works of the direct passing on of traits from parents to children. Cole sums up his viewpoint of Darwin and the consequences of natural selection concisely. He saw Darwin as the destroyer of the foundations of human liberty, as well as the recognition of any element of purpose in human life, and he sought to give man back his liberty by insisting that the individual could not only learn by his own effort to master his environment better, but could also transmit this learning through a process of heritable biological adoption. The notion of the man who raged against the nature of family life in the way of all flesh, turning to the family unit as his defence of his beliefs about evolution, is an irony that is likely lost on few who knew Butler or his work. As Cole notes, Butler regarded the family as the great transmitting agency of acquired habits. Butler would come to explain his own viewpoint of inheritance from a familial aspect, but did not elaborate in any great fashion. As Butler saw it, there had to be a direct continuation of memory between parents and their offspring, 
A C.E.M. joke illustrates. It was George Bernard Shaw who was able to clarify and express Butler's position on the questions of development and inheritance in the evolutionary process. We are now in a position to enumerate the four main heads of Butler's position. They are 1. The oneness of personality between parents and offspring. 2. Memory on the part of the offspring of what it did in the person of its forefathers. 3. The latency of this memory until it is rekindled by a recurrence of associated ideas. 4. The unconsciousness with which habitual actions come to be performed. Samuel Butler's prolonged and public argument went to the core of the disagreements over the theories of evolution presented by various parties in the 19th century. Butler was deliberately iconoclastic and seemed to relish in the attention his attacks on Darwin produced. Charles Darwin tended not to respond to Butler out of, interestingly enough, a fear of the author's vehemence. Ultimately, Samuel Butler provided a notable attack on the tenets of natural selection from the point of view of an interested amateur arguing from a philosophical and intellectual regard that had no grounding in a methodological scientific approach whatsoever. His role in poking out logical problems of Darwin's theory centred on elements of natural selection that can be found in the works of Buffon, Lamarck and Erasmus Darwin himself. From Butler's viewpoint, this was a travesty that served to wipe these men's works from the historical record. Butler's other major problem came from the fact that Darwin had not provided a satisfactory answer to the question his work on natural selection offered up from its very title. What exactly is the origin of species? Where is the genesis point, the very beginning? Finally, Butler's other major problem with On the Origin of Species came from the mechanistic viewpoint of the universe that this and other evolutionary theses were creating. It seemingly brought Butler back to the desire of having a theistic outlook on the universe, which he had turned away from years earlier. The seeds of Butler's career of standing against Darwin's view of natural selection can all be found in Erewhon, many of which he would develop later in his evolutionary works. It would not be until the event of Gregor Mendel's work on discontinuous inheritance, which was subsequently rediscovered by the likes of Carl Eric Korins and Hugo de Vries, that these scientists' work would see the beginnings of the science of genetics, which would ultimately put Butler's arguments finally to rest.